on that morning, there were 24 of us. We walked in a single aisle all the way to the back of the store where the lunch counter was, and we sat down. And immediately, we were told that we, we could not sit there. We had to get up. I think it was the manager who came out and told us that we had to move because there was a bomb planted in the building. My sisters and I pretty much grew up in two worlds. We grew up in an upper middle class world of members of St. Mark's Episcopal Church, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and, and Omega Psi Phi Fraternity and the Lynx Incorporated. We grew up in Jack and Jill. That was one foot. The other foot was planted firmly in the NAACP. Minerva's father, J. Arthur Brown, was president of the Charleston chapter of the NAACP from 1955 to 1960. He led a concerted effort to desegregate publicly funded spaces and institutions, including golf courses, beaches, state parks, theaters, lunch counters, and schools. I'm not exactly sure when he got the bug, but once he got the bug, he just ran with it. There was no looking back. It was infectious. He didn't have to tell us that this was the way. We talked about things that were happening in the world, things that were happening in our community, wrongs that needed to be righted. Brown's efforts did not go unnoticed by opponents of the movement, and the family often received threats of arson, hateful tirades, and death threats. It happened at least twice that we woke up in the middle of the night, and the Klan was burning crosses in front of our our house is an attempt to intimidate us and to get my father to cease his activity. In the summer of 1957, Brown took his three daughters, including Minerva, to the Highlander Folk School in Monteagle, Tennessee, the same social justice leadership training school run by Miles Horton and attended by nearly all the major civil rights icons of the movement. It was here that Minerva's worldview would be forever shaped. It was a, an entirely different experience for us. It was probably the first time in my life that I've ever interacted with white people on an equal basis. And it was strange. It was the same summer that we met Martin Luther King there. Andrew Young was there. Eleanor Roosevelt was there. Rosa Parks. So was Ralph Abernathy, his deputy. We all ate together, we had workshops together, we played together, we had social events together. For Minerva, Highlander represented the world as it could be. During that summer, while at Highlander, Minerva met both Septima Clark and Esau Jenkins. I remember Mr. Esau coming and telling about all the challenges here on John's Island. And I remember being fascinated by him. Uh, he was a very, very talented man always thinking about the community, always thinking about the people. My father talking about the challenges in the city of Charleston, and they got to know each other because they were equally dedicated to the cause. We saw how dedicated they were. We learned not through their verbalizing things, but we, we emulated their, their actions. By the age of 15, Minerva was already helping to plan and execute demonstrations with her high school classmates from Burke. On April 1st, 1960, Minerva played a crucial role in what has become known as the sit-in that changed Charleston, which took place at the Crest Store on King Street. This was a part of a larger movement, and things were really beginning to escalate, um, not just locally, but, but nationwide. There were sit-ins and lions and eat-ins and wade-ins and swim-ins and, and all sorts of demonstrations. We knew we were a part of something that was going to be different and perhaps even history-making. At least a couple of months ahead of time, we practiced. 
We, we did a lot of role playing. We were instructed as to how we were to behave, in, in what manner, a nonviolent manner, of course. I think the most beautiful thing we could do would be to stage a mass sit-in or some type of demonstration. And if they did not serve us, to remain until they served us. If arrested, to go in jail. On that morning, there were 24 of us, all of us, at that point, we're high school students. We walked in a single file all the way to the back of the store with a lunch counter, and we sat down. And immediately, we were told that we, we could not sit there. We had to get up. We didn't say anything. We just sat there quietly. But um, after a few minutes, the manager came and removed the tops of the stools that were not occupied so that nobody else would, would join us there. So we sat and we sat and we sat. We did not talk among ourselves. The only words that were uttered were the Lord's Prayer. You gotta get up because you're gonna get in trouble, you know, you're gonna get arrested or you're gonna get kicked out of school. And then after a while, one of the waitresses came and poured real strong ammonia all over the lunch counter. Finally, I think it was the manager who came out and told us that we had to move because there was a bomb planted in the building. We knew that there was no danger of a bomb. And so we sat and we sat and we sat. After sitting for five and a half hours, without getting up to stretch, without going to the restroom, the police chief came and, and then told us that we were, we were under arrest. You see, being arrested at that point was like a badge of honor. But eventually the NAACP bailed us out. It was almost like we were local heroes. Minerva's journey in life eventually led her to become a librarian, teaching on John's Island for 18 years. And it was during this time that she made it her priority to resurrect the civil rights legacy of John's Island, and in particular, the work of Esau Jenkins. There was a certain presence here. It sort of reignited something in me when I came here. But it was around that same time that I was realizing that the, the students already learned that this was not something that was worth learning or, or holding on to. I, I mentioned Esau Jenkins. Nobody in the class knew who I was talking about. So I knew then my work was cut out for me. Students equate getting an education with being able to make a good living, but that's not the end of it. Being educated also means accepting a certain amount of responsibility for one's community and passing it on and helping other people along the way. That's where the hard work takes place. And it's not always pleasant because the problem still exists. The problems of gentrification, inequitable educational opportunities, of police brutality, lack of affordable housing, these problems are still existing. They haven't gone away. There's still a lot of work to be done, and we need young blood. We need people to replace those of us who will not be here forever. Mm -hmm.